Great. Uh, so if there are any topics that you'd like me to add to this workshop, please let me know in your feedback and comments at the end of it. Some of you, if you have a lot of experience already, might find it a little basic because I intended it to actually pick up from the basics for you know someone who has no experience. But if there's something you think I can add that could make it more interesting, by all means, you know, please feel free to let me know because the materials evolve every quarter and I rely upon your feedback to introduce new concepts and new topics. So what we're gonna to do today on day one is really just try to understand what's going on when you take an image in microscopy or you know, literally pretty much anything else. Even if you point and shoot with your cell phone, a pretty picture or a selfie, what exactly is being formed? What kind of filters can you apply? And what are they doing to your image? So we're going to understand things like, you know, the different file formats of the image, for example, how you color an image, RGB versus grayscale images, and what is the spatial resolution or the color resolution of an image? What kind of quantitative information can you pull out of it? And also, we're going to look at a few point operations on images and how you can manipulate pixels, individual pixels, to get information. So today is essentially going to be absolutely basic. It's the bread and butter building up to the core of this course, which is going to come in tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to learn about image filtering, which is how do you clean an image? How do you denoise it, for example? How do you enhance contrast if you're interested in doing that? And you know, how do you smooth out an image? And also, we're going to understand histograms the individual pixel values, what corresponds to your signal, what corresponds to your noise, and how do you pull out your signal from your noise? That's gonna be the meat of the workshop, and most of that is coming in tomorrow. And on the last day of the workshop, we're gonna extend that. Once you've learned how to pull out the signal from the noise, how do you actually quantify that, identify important features, and go ahead and do interesting things to them? So that's gonna be, concluding our workshop. And all of this is gonna help you assemble a very simple, basic pipeline for image processing. And another quick bit of logistics for whoever's taking this for grades. Uh, you're gonna work entirely in the Colab notebook. There's nothing special really that you have to do even if you're taking it for grades. I'm gonna email you guys a quiz at the end of each workshop session. It's just gonna be like a short, you know, five, six question quiz. I would recommend that everybody, not just whoever's taking it for credit, do that quiz. It's really short. It's gonna take you like 15 minutes, but it's gonna test how much you've understood from the concepts of that day. And then the next day in class, first thing at 9 a.m., we're gonna discuss that quiz and go through the answers. And those who are taking it for grades, you got to send me the answers before 8.30 a.m. the next morning, and I'm going to send you back your score. And something nice about your score, if you get an answer wrong and you send me another answer sheet saying, this was my wrong answer, this was why my answer was wrong, I'm going to give you half credit for that. So you literally you know, cannot get less than 50% in this course, okay? Because I guess... Come on, I don't want you guys to be miserable, but I do want you to like learn and be happy about it. Um, and a little, a little disclaimer before we start that when you take this course, you're not gonna become an expert in image processing. That's gonna take you like weeks and months of work of actually sitting down with a lot of resources, working on different problems and you know going ahead and doing your own thing. My intention is for you to be able to understand what you're doing, to be able to follow online documentation, and to be able to independently work and learn more advanced concepts on your own. So great. Uh, let's start with the first activity. If you guys could just like pair off into groups or something, especially if you're here, I want you to take like a few minutes. Look at this image over here that I'm going to minimize this and make sure you see more clearly. Um, this is a picture of cells where the nuclei have been stained with the nuclear dye hooks, and they've just been imaged on the slide. And you can actually see some interesting features. Some of these nuclei are brighter than others. 
So you can see a certain amount of unevenness in the staining. And some of the nuclei over here, like this one, you can see really bright spots within a darkish background. And then in other structures, you can see, you know, stuff like this, which is like two bright condensed spots. That's actually the chromatin segregating to divide the cells, you know, like pulling the chromosomes apart. Now I want you to like answer a simple question. Think about it for a few minutes. If I asked you to tell me the number of dividing cells in this and whether they're in S phase or, you know, G2 phase or whatever, by hand, just eyeball the image. And then imagine that I gave you a time lapse over three hours of a whole field of cells dividing. So it's like maybe uh, 180 images. I took them one per minute. And I want to know all the dividing cells, how many divisions there are. And I want you to do this manually. I just want you to take a few minutes and think about this very specific challenges that you would face while doing that. So it's not rocket science, right? You can just look at it. If you, if you just eyeball it and all the information is right there. Why would you want to write any code for this? Do you guys want to like turn to your groups or whatever and just like talk about it a bit? You, you three could probably be one group. My question is, if you wanted to count the number of nuclei and measure their sizes, and tell me over a period of three hours in 180 images like this, how many cells have divided? Just look at it and do it. Why would you not want it? Why would you want to alter it? So one more minute and then we'll open it up to a discussion in class. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if the application is really I thought it would be good. It could be good. Okay, so let's open it up to a discussion like with all of us. And I guess I'm going to give folks online the first go. Uh, does anyone want to volunteer an answer? Like an, an idea, what do you think would be a challenge? Like why would you want to do it or why would you not want to do this? Someone from online. Uh, I could imagine you'd want to do it that way in case you wanted to see exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, and that way, you know, you can actually see and observe cells mm -hmm. dividing and, and tracking them by hand rather than yeah, trusting a machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point that sometimes you want to do it because, you know, something that you can see as opposed to something a machine has done, you just trust it more. Like you believe what you see. That's a good reason. Anyone else have any thoughts? Well, if you could see yep. it, then I guess you wouldn't have to take this course. But any other yeah. thoughts? Yeah. Um, hi, this is Satpal. Mm -hmm. So I think um, you might need to extract the information uh, that cannot be seen by naked eye sometimes. And then mm -hmm. you can 
uh, you, so that you can use you know machine to interpret that information for you. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what I think uh, one of the reasons that you need uh, image processing. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, you know, once you extract the information, uh, you can perform operations on it. Uh, you know, uh, and then those 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 can be you know, simple operations to most complex operations. But, but you know, in order to perform that, you need to extract the information and that's where machine processing, you know, comes into action. Yep, yep, that's a great answer. Sometimes if I extract the information by just writing things down on a piece of paper, that's just not good enough because I want to do more complex, interesting things with it. One more point from the online folks. Um, I think at least the risk of doing this manually is that there's always the risk of like narrator reliability issues. So doing using a computational method could be mm -hmm. more robust, I guess. Fantastic. I mean, so this is the kind of stuff that, you know, you joke about, right? You're going to give it to the undergrad to do, which honestly, if I had an undergrad, I would never do that. But the thing is, if you give it to undergrad A versus undergrad B, are they going to give you the same answer? That's not so sure. But if you give it to computer A versus computer B, yes, they are going to give you absolutely the same answer. And take another example here. I'm pointing to like these two dots here. Are these dividings? Maybe, maybe they're like two halves of the same nucleus. Are these dividing? I don't know, you could say yes, I could say no, I'm not really clear about it. But with the code, with an automated system, you can fix up very, very clear criteria that you know there's. it removes a lot of the ambiguity and variability of the analysis. So that's a great point, Nathan. And folks in the room? Right, yes. Yeah, if I have one of the images, I really don't want to be doing this by hand. And I don't want my undergrad to be doing it by hand. And I can't pay an army of people on Mechanical Turk to do it by hand either. So a computer would just do it while I'm sleeping overnight if I start the code at 8 p.m. when I go home or whatever. And you get the answers fast and easy. Great. Um, Jason? One reason not to do it would be... Uh, we don't know what the outcome we're looking for is. Mm -hmm. It's just simply we added a substrate that we want to just understand whether mm -hmm. it's divided or not. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't need any specificity. Mm -hmm. um, it could slow us down. Mm -hmm. So I think just being out and going into it. Yes. Perfect. That's that's a really good point, too. And I think that's something I like about the points that you all have brought up. Like, you know, even Giancarlo had mentioned at first that sometimes you really want to see what is happening. So putting all of the things that you guys said together, there are very good reasons why you want to automate this pipeline, but there are also specific situations where you do not want to just blindly rely on an automated pipeline. So let's look at a couple of those. Um, I'm going to formalize these things here, that yes, it's totally variable, it's cumbersome, it's time consuming, and I'm running a microscopy experiment right now down the hallway that is generating 600 gigabytes of data. Do I want to go through that by hand? I think not. It's, it's a big data problem. And at this point, when we do microscopy experiments, you're expected to think of these things as big data problems. And therefore, you require automation for consistency, throughput to go through everything well and take it forward for good applications where you can do fancy things with the data and so on. But given the caveats that Jason and Giancarlo brought up, I am gonna put it forward to you. When you're developing your pipeline, it's actually kind of crucial that at many stages, you do eyeball what is going on. You do stop and be a human in the loop, looking at you know whether you're computing the right kind of data that you're interested in. Take a look at your image after every operation you do to it. It's a sanity check. Your eyes are a sanity check. If your eyes can't tell what is happening, your computer cannot tell what is happening. So use yourself as a resource when setting up these problems, especially sometimes when you're training machine algorithms to do these things. You need to go and annotate these things. It's like the big secret of 
uh, the dirty secret of computer vision and neural networks and stuff, right? Like, wow, this cool neural network processed all my images. It knows everything about me from my eyeball scan. But no, somebody has to go in there with 10,000 images and sit and manually annotate each one of these through some kind of interface. And every time we have like a CNN course, one week before the class, there's always like, you know, kids pulling all nighters and crying about how many images they have to annotate and couldn't they just have done this three weeks ago and so on. So yes, you need humans in the loop at some point. But at the same time, machines can give you a lot of flexibility and reliability. And that's why you want to understand both sides of the problem. Yeah. So one of the challenges of image processing, like a lot of you mentioned that you work with genomic data. And for example, if you work with single cell data, Sometimes it's like a more straightforward pipeline, right? Like you take your FASTA files and then you do certain kinds of quality control. You remove your mitochondrial genes or your outlier cells or your poor quality cells. And then you put it through your SIRA pipeline and then you get your output and you know what that pipeline looks like. I can't really give you the same for image processing. There's no such thing as you put it in here, you do these five steps and you're going to poop out a result that makes sense. The challenge with image processing, the reason why it's even still such a hot research topic is because every problem is a snowflake in some sense, and you've got to understand and love your snowflake and appreciate its beauty and its shape and everything. And once you have the shape of your problem, understanding what your problem's specific challenges are, then you'll be able to apply the right techniques to solve your problem. That need not be the right techniques to solve any other problem on the planet, but that's what makes image processing both challenging and interesting. So I wanna like hammer this in again and again, please don't have the expectation that there's gonna be a pipeline that you're gonna come up with at the end. And that's why I wanna emphasize the concepts. Those are more important. And I really made it very, very obvious. It's not a pipeline. It is rather a toolbox where you have a whole bunch of tools that you can use. And the whole point is to understand what kind of tools you have, like what does this thingy do? Or what does this blue thingy do? Once you know what it's going to do to your stuff, then you know whether it makes sense for you to use it or not. So our goal in this workshop is essentially to understand a, what tools are out there? What are the common tools? B, what are they doing to your image? And that's why our approach in this workshop is gonna be, you take an image, you apply each of these tools to it, these automated tools, and then you as the human eyeball the result and see what it looks like and develop the intuition for what that tool is doing to your image. I do want to point out that even though we're going through our notebook in Python, that's not the only way you can do image processing. And in fact, that's not even the way I would recommend that you start off for any problem. There are many packages that exist off the shelf, and I would absolutely encourage you guys to go ahead and check out some of these. And I encourage you to the point where I have gone ahead and uh, done some of this for you, actually. I'm going to hide this. I need floating meeting controls. Yay. OK, so the first thing I want to point out is uh, Fiji. Fiji is like this open source GUI kind of thing where you just drag and drop images and you click buttons on a menu and it processes your image for you. And we're going to be doing a Fiji demo in class on day three. This is like a super common package, the sort of like first line for everybody doing microscopy, throw your images on Fiji and see what's the basic thing you can do. Something else I would also recommend is a cell profiler. This is like a super popular software, which, you know, has a lot of like built-in pipelines that you can borrow and apply. It's kind of like Galaxy for sequencing data, but this is for imaging data. So do go ahead and check Cell Profiler. They have a very nice YouTube channel that gives you a lot of uh, tutorials for how to use it. It's something that I would absolutely recommend. If you want to identify cells and nuclei and whatnot in your images, Another suggestion would be throw your data on CellPose. CellPose is like this neural net that's trained on a lot of different microscopy data sets. 
like on a lot of different kinds of them. So chances are cell posts can segment and identify your cells. If cell posts can't do it, then you think about other solutions, but usually right off the box, it is often a very nice first go. So please go explore cell posts with your data. And uh, it's to the point where when I benchmark algorithms that I write, I say cell posts did this accuracy, it got like 92% accuracy, I got 98% accuracy, <laughs> I'm better than cell posts. So that's like a gold standard reference that I use when talking about my pipelines. And what else? Uh, yeah, so I want you also to pull up, um, Ooh, I've been digging into this a bit too much. There, circuit image. That's the set in Python that we'll be working through during this workshop. And uh, MATLAB has an image processing toolbox that does essentially the same things. And a couple of other things. Yeah, there's OpenCV, which is for a computer vision. It's like another Python toolbox. And UNet is another popular neural network that people have been using for a cell segmentation, which also does this fabulous job. We had these crazy cells that were like, I don't know, long hairs. They were like algae filaments that were crawling around. And I don't know, UNet segmented that. We were like amazed that, you know, it did a great job. And we had to do a ton of manual training for it before it did that job. So please go ahead and check out the resources. I've given you guys a bunch of other resources as well. And two of these I wanted to point out that I really, really like. Uh, this is the iBiology website. It's put together by Ron Bale, who's a really famous cell biologist from UCSF. And it's a collection of resource videos that are completely open and free, meant for your learning. They have a series on microscopy where they explain everything from the parts of a scope. You learn everything from how an image is formed to how you can take apart your fancy size scope and actually put it back together and get it to work perfectly. There's also this bioimage analysis course, which I would also recommend. It's short, it's like four or five videos, but it's really good. And this thing, bioimagebook.github, it's a really cute book. It's written by somebody who runs an image analysis and microscopy core facility at, I forget where, but I love the book. It's cute. And they use like the cutest pictures of cells ever. It's like adorable. And just for that, you have to check out this book. Cool. So these are a bunch of my favorite resources. And uh, like I said, you have to go and explore these resources, work on more problems, and that makes you an expert in image processing. Yeah. Uh, from the Fiji cell profiler cell hoax, uh -huh. uh, what types of tools are they using? Are they using similar tools that we're discussing today? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So basically, so when you say tools, they're mostly mathematical operations right. that you do on images. And most of those operations are common to many, many, many tools. Like you can do the same exact thing in Fiji by clicking buttons that you would do in our code today. So that's why I was gonna figure out, help you figure out like what's going on under the hood for all of these things. So even if you're clicking, you know what to click and in what order and so on. Yeah. If someone received MATLAB, what, what would be like an example of a MATLAB library? That um, so image processing toolbox is the popular one. And as far as I'm aware, the syntax, the code, the names of the functions, everything, it's almost exactly the same. I, it's been a long time since I used it. Uh, but it was like so seamless to switch from MATLAB to Python. Basically, there's just like a set of ideas that you have, and it doesn't matter what you execute those ideas on. Yes. You talk, about, you talk a lot about cells, but tissue uh, analysis would be the same. Right, yeah. So tissue analysis is often the same. There's going to be like some specialized cases, of course, because you're handling, um, I guess the spatial component becomes much, much more important. But uh, many of the pipelines that we use do give you spatial data as well. And unless you have very thick tissues, if you have thin slices, then it's pretty much the same principles, yeah. Any other questions before we jump into our notebook?
Online folks, any questions? Great. So if there's nothing really right now, I'm going to like uh, introduce the notebook and we're going to start installing the packages that we need. Uh, I've also put in a link here to the documentation for Scikit image, which I've pulled up here. So you can see that Scikit image essentially has a bunch of modules. And if you click on each module, for example, filters, it's going to tell you all the different filters that exist in Scikit image. And let's pick, I don't know, a random filter, say the median filter. It's going to tell you what the syntax is, what the inputs are, what each thing means, and so on. And one of your goals through this workshop should be to learn to read and understand such documentation, because when you're writing a new pipeline of your own, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to use. Um, so keep the link open, and you might find reason to refer to it multiple times. Okay. But yeah, so let's go ahead and look at section zero, which is importing and installing all the packages that we need. The first thing we're going to do is, uh, ah, I wanted to point this out. So when I write this hash symbol, it's a comment. It's not going to get executed. So I can write literally anything I want here that... It's a beautiful day, despite the showers or whatever, and nothing's going to happen. My computer is not going to read that. The code is not going to get executed. So if you want to make notes or write things for yourself, this is a good way. Just put the hash and everything in green is going to be a comment. Okay. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is import a library called NumPy, which is going to help you handle numbers. So I want you to get into the cell, put your cursor there and click shift and enter or hit this play button, one of the two. And then when you've done that, we wanna check whether you actually installed NumPy. So click the second box and it should tell you the number, the version number of NumPy that you're using and you know maybe just print the value of Pi. So Pi is built into NumPy, and this should tell you if your code is working. So can everyone get up to this point and then give me a thumbs up? Working? And sorry for the coding, guys. I know this is super basic for you, but I basically just want everybody to catch up in the next 30 minutes before we dive into like the deeper stuff. Did you get it? That worked, right? Yes, so just click that. Um, in the next one. Great, you got it. Well, cool. So the next thing you need is something to actually display your images. And we're going to use something called Matplotlib. So please run that and test that you run it by plotting something very simple. You're just plotting, you know, uh, 0 to 10 against 10 to 0. So you should get like an inverted line like that. And everybody get up to this point. If anybody cannot get up to this point, then let me know. Yes. So there are two different cells. In the end, this one it only executes up to here. So that just imports the MacLaurin package. Um, and it installs that library on your you know, runtime and run it or whatever. Then the next one is for us to verify that we actually do it. And for that, I just wrote a simple line of code to make that a little bit more clear. So if that's not work, that's like which yes, we installed it. Something got changed. Did you click this? Great, and then try it again. There you go. So you have to go in order because it can't do it in between. So you have to follow each cell in order. 
And for anybody online who needed the help, you have to go through each cell in order because you need stuff that was installed before. So now let's get into the fun stuff where we're going to import scikit image. So we're going to import it and print our version number. And you guys should mostly have 0.18.3. That's like the standard version that we're using. And you, you see, I've done it in like two ways here. I've imported scikit image, the whole thing. But then from scikit image, I want very specific modules. So these are the different modules that we're going to be using during this workshop. And I've imported all of them in the first line. OK, and this is, this is where you get all the different modules. So when you write your pipeline, it depends on where you're going to find your module. And you're going to like put it into your notebook and import specifically that. Try not to import everything because it's just too heavy. It's going to slow down your code. So keep it simple and import only what you need. And the first thing we're going to do is look at our first image. Something I love about Circuit Image, it has a lot of demo images built into it. So if you want to like play with stuff, you can use these demo images. And we're going to use this image of a bush. So what you can immediately see is that you can pull out the number of dimensions of an image. So an image is a 2D thing, right? You have X and Y, so it has two dimensions. And yes, uh, Psychic Image recognizes that. And second, you want to get the size of the image. So images have properties. And there's a property called shape, which has two, you know, like, OK, Python counts from 0. So it doesn't go 1, 2. It goes 0, 1. So the two properties of the shape are the x dimension, the x length, and the y length. So it tells you it's like 25 by 25 pixels. Want you to like execute the next thing and see what the image looks like to the computer. When you say image, you're thinking of a picture. But what the computer is seeing is just a bunch of numbers that are arranged in specific locations. This looks crazy, right? It looks absolutely nothing like a picture, but this is what your computer understands. And this is what your entire pipeline is going to be dealing with. And if you want to see as a human, what do these numbers actually translate into? Then you use this command called imp show, which we're going to do throughout this workbook and execute that. And that's what your bush looks like. Maybe not the bush that you were expecting. So this is from a very famous image data set, which has a collection of faces of, I don't know, like 100,000 faces or something from a lot of different celebrities and, you know, politicians and people in the media and Hollywood stars and whatnot, and faces in different angles and profiles. And it was one of the training data sets that was used for all these face recognition, you know, big software endeavors. And um, yeah, because it's in the open source domain, it's been included in Sakit Image as one of the demos. So everybody got up to here? Online, guys, give me a thumbs up if you have it. Awesome. Jasmine and Meghna, were you able to get to this point? Great. Cool. So at this point, it's 10. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back and do a little bit of theory. I know today is going to be a little slow for many of you guys, but I do want to build up the basics for everyone before we get into the hard stuff, okay? So let's come back at 10.5, and at 10.5, we're going to start talking about how do you form an image? When you take a picture, what exactly is happening and what is the data that you're capturing? And what are the limitations of what you can and cannot capture? Okay, so yeah, five minutes. The restrooms are just down the hallway for the ladies and one floor down for the men. So yeah, 10 five, I'll see you guys back. Uh, picture and how is it like? Oh, you have a question. 
So we're going to go into that in the next section, actually, okay. that uh, you can see these boxes, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So each box is a pixel. Right. And you can see the numbers, like yes. over here, this number is 0 0.067, whatever. So if your pixels are really, 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 really small, mm -hmm. then you don't see Absolutely. the difference. Yeah. Like in this photograph of Manuel, for yeah. example, the picture, the pixels are tiny. There's a resolution. Is it? Exactly, that's the resolution. That is when the pictures, sorry, if the pixels become big, mm -hmm. that's when you stop being able to see the clear outline. Okay. And we're going to go into that in the next section. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I have some issues connecting to the internet. But now we're good. Um, I just it says uh, install. Where am I? What am I installing here? Or where is it? Uh, can we just go through each one of these? They're already there. Oh, they're already in. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Ah. That's why I love Colab. There we go. This is so little to do. Because I didn't want you guys to like spend forever installing stuff for the class. I too, I'm going to get support to it. Yeah, yes. I have a little bit of experience with it. Um, let me just start a little bit of basic. Okay. Basic, okay, so far. Hope it's not too slow, but just for another hour, bear with me. Sorry for me. Cool. Just wrapping it up. Ah, I see. I cannot wrap my head around R. Yeah, so I'm like. Python seems like it's going to be a little friendlier than Flash. It's supposed to be super friendly. Like yeah. the reason I switched to Python was because it's such an attractive teaching language. Right. And it's open. I don't have to ask people to spend 80 bucks on a license right. for it. And I can make the notebooks online and stuff. R is also open source, uses the same interfaces and stuff, but I cannot get used to the, the going this the way. way. You can yeah. Change that Really? Okay. That <laughs> makes a huge difference. <laughs> so I guess you get so used to thinking left to right that I yeah. just cannot do the. I don't like it. I don't like that either. <laughs> Sorry. I'm 
No, I keep doing the same thing. Oh, it's good. Like, it's good. Yeah. No, I want to get closer to this. Yeah, it's just I have to do that. So we're going to get started again. And for the next 30, 40 minutes or so, we're going to go through some theory heavy stuff. And I promise you, this is going to be like the only theory heavy stuff in the next three days. Uh, after that, we're going to get busy playing with code and we're going to do fun stuff with colors later in this class. Okay. So bear with me for the theory. But I do want to go into the basics. We're talking about images. What the hell is an image? I just showed you that the computer thinks it's a huge bunch of numbers. You think it has like, you know, all these shapes, triangles and noses and flowers and whatnot. But where does all of this really come from? What does the data look like? So this is my uh, relatively crude drawing. Don't judge my drawing. Um, but I basically drew, that's your slide up there. And this is a picture of a cell that's falling on the detector of your camera or whatever is collecting that image, okay? And firstly, what you can see is that my camera detector is not a continuous thing. It's broken up into these little squares, kind of like a chocolate bar, and each of those pieces is a pixel. So whenever you say your camera is like 12 megapixels, what that really means is that you've got 3,000 squares on this side and 4,000 squares on this side. And the product of that, you've got like, you know, 12 million squares in total, and that's your 12 megapixel camera, okay? So you really wanna know pixels in your camera. Now, each of these pixels is like this little hardware sensor thingy that is sensitive to light. And it produces a teeny electric current when light falls on it. It converts that light energy to electricity, okay? So what each pixel is detecting is the number of light particles or photons that are falling on that particular pixel. And if it's counting the number of photons, it can count forever, right? Like you can just keep counting, but you want it to like not count forever. If you count something forever, it's infinite. So you fix a certain amount of time, that's called your exposure time. Like when you take snapshots on your cell phone during the daytime, you want a short exposure, but in the night, you want to really keep it stable and take a long exposure. That's because when you have less photons, you want to collect more of them to get sufficient electric current to detect. And when you have more photons, you really want to keep it short, like sample a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to be overwhelmed with so much coming at you. So that's your exposure time. That's something you really have to keep in mind when you're configuring how to take your image well. And after that, it's very, very simple, right? If you count the number of light particles that reach each box within a certain period of exposure time, and you write it down as a number, that gives you an image. And what you do to actually get that nice little black and white picture is right here. You translate those numbers to a scale. And this is where the concept of a digital image comes in, right? Because, well, light brightness is continuously varying, but I can't continuously vary something on a computer. Like I have to have levels of something. So what I'm gonna do is say, okay, if I counted between zero and 31 photons, that's gonna be pure black. I'm just gonna color that pure black. If I count between 31 to 63, I'm gonna color that kind of sort of grayish, like very dark, but not black. And if I count say between 191 and 223, then I'm gonna color it this kind of lightish gray. So I'm gonna assign, you know, like I'm gonna bin these values into different boxes and say for each of these boxes, I'm gonna give it an approximate you know, color or whatever. Clearly, the more number of levels I divide this into, the finer my color resolution gets. And I can't go beyond a certain level. 
what is that level? That is fixed by the sensitivity of my pixels, the number of photons I'm getting and my exposure time. I cannot count half a photon. Like I just cannot. So if I've measured something that's on a range of zero to 300 photons, and I said, I want 600 colors on this, give me colors for every half photon, that makes no sense. You never want to set up your collection like that. And if somebody collects that and tells you, wow, look, I have this amazing resolution on my image, don't get fooled by it. It's, it's just fiction, okay? So the other thing you cannot count is half a pixel. Each pixel is one unit. It's integrating over that entire sensor. So if somebody tells you, you know what, I've got nanometer resolution because my pixels, I can tell you like in a quarter pixel what is going on, rubbish. You don't want to believe that. So these limits on your data, the lower base limits on what is the minimum distance or intensity that you can measure, that's called the resolution of your image. So you have three dimensions, right? You have X, you have Y, these are the spatial dimensions. That fixes your spatial resolution in terms of number of pixels or megapixels or whatever. And then you have your intensity resolution, which is the number of photons you're collecting, and that fixes your brightness resolution, okay? Let's go a little deeper into spatial resolution. Yeah. Sorry, on the, um, the 12 megapixel example, mm -hmm. four by three, mm -hmm. uh, what are the units? It's four- Four K pixels by three K pixels okay. on each side. Now a pixel can have a physical dimension. Like for example, on a lot of CCD devices, a uh, size of a single pixel is 6.5 microns by 6.5 microns. Okay. Um, but that has, that means nothing to you in effect, you know, when you're capturing something from far away, for example, because you really care about the number of pixels and what you're dividing that size over. Where it becomes more meaningful is when you're trying to get, for example, the scale of a microscopy image, right? If I take this, this phenopodium over here for this cell, and I want to measure the actual size of that phenopodium or the diameter of this nucleus on my microscopy image, then I want to know how many microns on my actual image correspond to how many pixels, and that gives you the scale of the image. So from that, you back calculate, you fix the scale that's common for you know, a certain configuration of camera, objective, whatever, your hardware configuration, and then you translate that scale back to your image to measure distances. Got it. Um, yeah. So if you have 200 megapixels, mm -hmm. uh, I guess we're gonna get there. So. Uh, yeah, let me just finish this and I'll get back to your question. Yeah, so here I'm showing you the effect of varying the size of the pixels, the density of the pixels. So if I have a lot of pixels over here, I can capture really small changes in shape because I'm able to measure that much. But if I have really, really big pixels, then it's going to be crappy. You saw the image of the bush. It looks kind of blurred and crappy. That's because, you know, each pixel is capturing so much of the features of the face that you're just not able to get enough spatial resolution. So when you take images, all of image processing actually starts with having good images to begin with. So take nice images, make sure you have sufficient resolution on your detector to actually capture the features that you want. And, you know, uh, don't try to measure anything that's smaller than one pixel. Any questions? Cool. So I'm gonna to come to another important concept that's called binning, binning pixels. And what I do when I bin is I take, for example, these four pixels, and instead of giving you the number of photons in each of these, I give you the average number of photons in all four of these. And on the face of it, that sounds like an absolutely stupid thing to do, right? Like I just made your resolution half. Like instead of giving you four pixels, I just gave you one value instead. Why on earth would I want to do that? Why would I want to mess with my resolution that way? Any, take, take a minute and discuss between yourselves and try to think about why would I do such a stupid thing when I've been harping on spatial resolution?
the moment. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Well, some uh, shades are out of not that old mm -hmm. pixel, but uh, I don't know, maybe. Right. So that's a good consideration. You're thinking about it, right? But I'm actually making it worse, right? Because if I build, I'm losing detail there. So counterintuitive. Been telling you you can't measure half pixel, and here I am adding them. Online folks, anybody? Why would I want to add my pixels and average them? They increase your signal. Yep, they increase my signal. Very good. You're on the right track, but that's half the answer. Can anyone give me the other half? What's the other side of signal? It reduces the graininess. Very good. It reduces the graininess. Uh, so it's a combination of the both. You sacrifice of everything that all three of you said. You sacrifice a little bit of your spatial resolution to get a better signal to noise ratio. Because you see, go back to this image, and I'm showing you this pixel over here, which is technically empty. It should have zero photons, right? Nothing in this world has zero photons. You're gonna have some thermal noise. You're gonna have some scattering, some crap happening here and there. And you're gonna get maybe one photon or zero or two or five or like some kind of random background noise. You cannot avoid that background noise. You may not see it, your image may look perfectly dark and beautiful. That doesn't mean the random noise is not there. If it's not there, be suspicious. Something has happened. It is not a raw image, okay? And this random noise usually has a normal distribution. And when you average over a larger number of pixels, what you're doing is negating the effect of the random variation. So you're taking that and building it up to kind of like a kind of sort of an average, you know, you get towards the mean of that distribution. And that's like a, a offset in your entire image that you can sort of subtract out. So the reason why you add things together or you average things, it's not just because you add the signal. The signal is real. And when you add the signal, you're really getting something. But for example, over here, if you got some signal and a random noise of five, and here you got like, say, no signal, but a random noise of two. But then you average it out and you get like some signal with a mean random noise floor of one. You've just improved your signal to noise ratio. So that's why you generally bin pixels to average out your random noise and improve your signal to noise ratio, but a little bit at the cost of the spatial features that you're trying to image. Yeah. So I guess you kind of maybe didn't expect that. You thought X and Y and intensity are independent things. No, they're slightly related. And when you take your images, you got to take that into account. Uh, I have a quick question or two, yes. actually. Yeah. Um, is, this, is this similar to uh, doing a Gaussian blur on the image in order to kind of uh, remove, I guess, the edges a little bit? Um, so you are on the right track. We do do Gaussian blurs at the, yeah, to sort of like improve noise properties at the expense of image sharpness, absolutely. And we're gonna go into that in detail tomorrow. Yeah, and the reason we do Gaussian blurs is also because NOS is Gaussian. Yeah, yeah, you're on the right. right track. And then uh, another question I noticed on the previous figure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when talking about pixels, I don't, what would be the difference, I guess, between 8-bit and 16-bit? I know sometimes when capturing resolutions, uh, and I, I'm not really sure what the difference is. Maybe we One can talk about it. And we're getting there. Got it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Manuel, for the question. Is Should I call you Manuel? Is that good? Yeah, that's perfect. Or you can call me Manny as well. Everyone calls me Manny. Great. Awesome. Thanks for the questions. Anyone else? Cool. So now I told you, okay, your pixel size is what limits your spatial resolution. But that's not the only thing. So far, I've been telling you that, oh, yeah, light is photons. It's these particles. They're discrete. They fall on your pixel. You can count them. Sure, but light is also a wave, right? Like, because physics in our world is just freaking weird like that. And because light is a wave, that gives you some other really funky properties. Now, whenever you draw your amazing ray diagrams, you know, in middle school physics, 
uh, you would draw a lens like this and you would say, oh, my light is coming this way and getting focused to this perfect point at a detector. And these are the photons that I'm counting. It's like, yeah, then you get to like grad school and quantum physics and you're like, yeah, that was totally rubbish, right? Mm -hmm. So light is a wave and you're going to get all these wavy things, which are going to give you like more wavy stuff over here. And that wave nature is totally going to limit your resolution. It doesn't matter if you created amazing cameras with, you know, like half a nanometer pixel size or whatever. You're limited by the wave nature of light and therefore by the wavelength of light that you are imaging it. So that brings us to something called the point spread function, which you're going to hear a lot of when you do microscopy. So if you image a dot, a dot is not a dot. It is never a dot. It is, let me get a good pen. It is going to be a little circle like this with a dark ring and then a bright ring and a dark ring and another bright ring and this bunch of fringes that you get because light is going like this. Okay, this is spreading a single point. Like uh, you can actually do this you can take, for example, a 50 nanometer bead and put it on a glass cover slip and take an image. And you will notice that if it's 50 nanometers, you know, typically it should just be a point. It should just be one pixel. It's not going to be one pixel. It'll be like three or four pixels. And you can actually measure this size. And I encourage you, if you have access to a scope, to go ahead and do it. Like, don't just believe me. Measure what your point spread function is. You're going to get something funky like this. What that means for our images is if I have a second point, and the second point is here, then I draw a circle here. I am never going to be able to resolve these two points. They might be, you know, a real distance of say 100 nanometers apart from each other. Maybe my pixels are so tiny and so fantastic that I can measure this. No, don't be fooled. You will only see a blur like this. So this is what you're going to see. Because of the wave. Exactly. So both of them are going to blur together. Okay. So this central circle is called the airy disk because the theory for this stuff was done by a physicist called airy. And this gives you the diffraction limit. So you're going to hear this term a lot when you're imaging, diffraction-limited images. And what that means is that your detector is nice. You have enough spatial resolution given your detector to pick up small distances. But what is getting in your way is the fundamental physics of our universe that is going to limit the spatial resolution that you can image. And I think you want to be in the diffraction-limited range, right? Because you can do better than this, but you can do better than a shitty detector. So try to make sure you're in the diffraction limited range. So how do you find the resolution limit, like how well you can resolve these two spots? You basically have to be able to fit two different, you know, Gaussians to the central array disks. And you can do that at this limit, which is 0.61 lambda by the aperture of your lens. Um, I'll go more into detail with this in a bit. Hang on. Um, but essentially, the disks have to be, you know, separated by their radius, at least, in order for you to be able to say there are two disks and not one. Does that make sense? If you don't, it's picture two, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is where they're both blurring into one. This is where you can just about tell the difference and you have this, you know, uh, one fourth intensity dip. So you can tell there are two different peaks. We consider this to be the limit of resolution. And this is when they're fully resolved. And this is true for all optical instruments, you know, telescopes, microscopes, they all, everything's diffraction limited. Uh, what this also means is that everything is proportional to the wavelength. So if I'm imaging something in really, really, really blue light, you know, if I have, say, um, Hoekst, which is a very blue dye, I illuminate in UV and it emits in blue. 
this could be totally different from a dye which also stains the same nucleus, but I excite it in far red and it emits in near infrared. Totally different because the wavelengths are different. So which one can you resolve a nucleolus or you know different nucleoli better, blue or red? Red? It's actually the other way around. Can you work it through for me? So if it's red, is the wavelength more or less? So the wavelength is a lot more actually. Uh, red wavelengths are around 600 nanometers and blue wavelengths are around 300. So what would be the minimum distance here for 600 compared to 300? If yeah, so say this is some constant, some number, and I'm doing something into 600 for the red, but something into 300 for the blue. So whatever the distance is for blue, it's basically half of what it is for red. Yeah, and so I need, I need to be closer together. It's fine if they are closer for blue light than for red light. So when you're doing multi-channel imaging, just you know, pay attention to that. If you want to resolve things, the wavelength matters. Red is actually really nice for another reason. In practice, actually, I would use red. And the reason for that is red is kinder on your cells or your tissues or whatever you're imaging. So I try to have things that are actually diffraction limited and resolvable in red because I really don't want to be shining blue light on my tissues. It's biologically, it sucks because, you know, UV, it messes your skin. So clearly it messes your tissues and everything. Did that make sense? Thank you. Any questions, folks? Two stands and an A stands for what? Ah, great. Thank you. I was almost mm -hmm. going to skip over that. So NA is numerical aperture of your lens. And it's essentially, you know, can you see them? These are the worst. So see, this is my lens. This is the cone in which I'm collecting light from this lens, right? If I'm focusing my image here. So the numerical aperture is this distance. It's basically like, you know, how much light am I getting in? So if you have a lens that's focusing here versus a lens that's focusing here, you know, you're having a higher NA because you're gathering more light, right? Because your cone is wider. Um, so drag the image. Let me read this. What are the units? Let me redraw, sorry, and then it will become a bit clearer. So I'm going to focus something like this and think about it. All of this light all over here, I'm not collecting. Mm. I'm collecting a very small angle of light. Whereas when I focus here, I'm actually collecting, you know, okay, I'm leaving out some light, but I'm collecting a much bigger fraction of the light, much bigger angle. So this is clearly better than this because I'm picking up more light with this. Numerical aperture is this distance, which is essentially sine of this angle. So it's you can think of it as just angle. It's an angle measure. Now it's not a simple angle measure. Everything that I drew here is in air. Sometimes you immerse your objectives in oil or water so you get a refractive index effect, you know, I have this and then I have some oil over here. I'm going to have uh, this. When you go from air to oil, you're going to bend away, right? No, you're going to bend towards. But uh, you get the picture. Essentially, if you change the refractive index, you bend the light such that you increase, you increase the goal. And so it's actually like numerical aperture times sine of the angle. Cool. 
But anyway, there is a lot of information that you don't necessarily need to know or remember. Just the takeaway from this is that you need to have the minimum uh, airy distance to be able to resolve spots that is wavelength dependent. And the shorter the wavelength, the better you can resolve. Yeah, any questions? A quick question, Harry. Uh, so um, I don't know. So this means that, um, you know, good quality devices can, con you know, can somehow control this. Um, you know, I mean, the minimum distance between the two spots, if we have, you know, a camera that is really a good quality. So when we say good quality, uh, what does that mean? You know, I mean, when you take good images, that does that has to do something with with what you just said right now relating to the diffraction so um, actually, threshold? Independent of that, because okay. the diffraction limit is just set by the physics of our universe and the wavelength of light. Right. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, yeah. Whereas when you say a good quality camera, there are a few mm -hmm. other properties that you look for. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you don't want your pixels to be so big that you can't even get to diffraction limited. You know, you want them to be at least a reasonable size. You okay. also want them to be able to pick up photons and give you enough intensity resolution. You know, mm -hmm. have a good linear response with number of photons that fall on the detector versus how much current they generate. Right. You want them to have a good range for that to be able to detect a broader range of photons and make mm -hmm. that conversion. And you yeah. want them to not randomly generate current because they're just getting hot. Okay. Because current is just movement of electrons and you can generate right. electrons through just thermal energy. Energy. Right. Yeah. So you that's okay. called the dark current, how much baseline they generate when there's no photon incidence, you want that to be low. And in some cases, you can lower that by water cooling your cameras or putting a Peltier on them. Okay. So really yeah. good information. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and just a quick uh, follow-up question. So the dis uh, two spots must be 0.61 lambda over numerical aperture distance apart to become mm -hmm. resolvable. Mm -hmm. So this is this is not controllable, right? I mean, it's controllable can't. by two things. It's controllable by lambda and numerical aperture, which yeah, in that sense, yep. Yeah. yeah, blue yeah. light, and you can also use objective lenses which have greater numerical aperture. Okay, okay, makes so sense. So when Thank you, you pick up a microscope lens, you will see a number on it. You will see, mm -hmm. you know, say magnification twenty x, which is the image is blown up twenty times. But you'll also see slash something NA. And that something NA is your numerical aperture. So if you have 20x.3 NA versus 20x.8 NA, the 0.8 NA is nicer because it's picking up much more light. The 0.3 is going to do this. The 0.8 is going to do this. So you're going to collect a lot more photons and a lot more signal. So when you're imaging, try to use high numerical aperture uh, objectives, especially if you're doing like confocal imaging or, you know, IHC slices and you really want to see features, try to go for high NA objectives. Yeah. Cool. And then we're going to go into bit depth. So Manu had asked that question before, what is 8-bit versus 16-bit? So bit is really simple. It's just how, uh, how many levels are you dividing the intensity into? So for example, I can do something really, really, really basic and silly. I can say, if photon falls on my detector, that's a one. If it doesn't fall on the detector, that's a zero. I don't care how many photons are falling. I can't count that. I can just say yes or no. So I only have one piece of information. And that is zero versus one. It's a one bit image. Right, because I've only divided things into two levels, something or zero. Now I can be a little more sophisticated than that. And I can say, you know, I can measure zero. I can also measure some maximum and I can measure maybe a couple of things in between. I know the halfway level and I can measure say below half, above half or slightly below above. So that way I've created maybe four levels. And that's a two bit image. Because if I write this in binary code, I need two bits, you know, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. 
to sort of represent that image. And likewise, eight bits basically means I need uh, eight binary digits to represent that image. And each binary digit is zero or one. So that is two into two into two into two, eight times, that's 256. So I can get pixel values between zero and 255. Mind you, it's one to 256, so zero to 255, if you shift uh, for an eight bit image. And likewise, a 16 bit image, I can chop it up even more, right? Like each of those eight bits gets chopped into half further. So that's two to the power of eight into two to the power eight, which is two to the power 16, which is, I don't know, something like 15,300 and whatever thingy. I knew this at some point, but essentially that's the number of levels, discrete levels that I can chop the brightness of my image into. That's Questions? Related, related to photon, photon. The photon count, that's right. And that depends upon the sensitivity of your detector, like Sakpal asked just now, the quality of the camera, how good is the camera in sensitively capturing each photon and translating that uniquely into a certain current value? Some things might be really crappy, right? Whether I get five photons or I get 20 photons, I'm just gonna generate like one amp of current, uh, one microamp of current. Some other things would be like, well, you know, if I get five photons, I'll make like five microamps. If I get 20 photons, I will make 20 microamps. That all depends upon the semiconductor material. So here's where quality of the camera and the detector does come into play, that it gives you the resolution. So whenever you buy a camera, you can actually look up the specs. A lot of commercial cameras usually have around 12-bit resolution for a microscopy. That gives you 4096 light levels. And that's pretty good, right? 49 to 6, it's, it's a good number of, you know, black and white colors to divide your intensity into. So that's what you get with typical cameras. Uh, note that supposing I take an image at 16 bit, I've collected a lot of information, right? Like I can distinguish between really, really fine levels. Then I convert this image to 8-bit. What I've basically done is I've sacrificed some of that resolution. I'm going to show you here with the 2-bit and 1-bit as an example. If I collect my image in 2-bit, I collected four intensity levels. Now, when I convert it to 1-bit, I am combining these two, and I'm combining these two and saying it's the same thing. I can do that. It's perfectly fine. I've lost information. But that's a valid operation. I can do that. But if I do it the other way around, if I collect it in one bit, and then I'll say, hey, one bit is not good enough. I want a better image. Let me save it as two bit. And then I'm going to magically get better resolution, right? Yes? No. Yeah, like totally no. Like what, what, what do you mean by that? You took this and you don't know whether it's this or this. Like I can't create information out of nowhere. So when you take an image, take it at the highest possible bit depth. You can throw out information if you don't care about it, but you cannot create information that doesn't exist. And always keep that in mind. Uh, just because you saved an 8-bit image as 16-bit doesn't mean it magically became 16-bit. It just means you did something that is potentially considered an unethical manipulation in data, don't publish stuff like that because your reviewer will come back to you and be like, you only took this at 8-bit. What do you mean 16-bit? You quantified this? Do you even think you had the resolution to begin with? And the answer is no. So be super careful. Never, ever, ever, ever do that. Never upsample bit depth. You want to downsample? Up to you. Totally. Go ahead. Yeah? So making an image more, I forgot the right word, fine, refined. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just start taking averages between two points and, and manipulate it that way and create some by just mm -hmm. like averaging. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to go into that a lot in depth tomorrow, like what is kosher and what is not. Uh, but in general, you can do all this averaging stuff. Although that doesn't necessarily give you better signal. It just gives you better signal to noise ratio by reducing your noise. Nothing can give you more signal than you've collected. So just 
when you start off, please collect the best signal you can. There's nothing you can do about it afterwards. And it's like, they tell you about makeup, right? Like there's no amount of foundation you can put if you don't have like healthy skin or whatever. It's the same thing. There's no amount of makeup you can put on an image if you haven't taken a healthy, good image to begin with. Sorry if that was like a weird analogy. <laughs> um, so in any case, uh, we're gonna come to color. So far I've just been talking about like black and white and grayscale levels. Color is pretty simple. You just measure at three different wavelengths, blue, green, and red, and you measure intensity in each of these, and that gives you color, the combination of intensities in each of red, green, and blue. So when you say for a computer display, if you have a 16 million color display, what it means is that you essentially have 16-bit red, 16-bit green, 16-bit blue, and if I multiply, you know, 16 bit by 16 bit by 16 bit, I get 16.7 million. Uh, you can do the math. I did it yesterday. It's a bit tedious, but uh, that's all there is to it. So you get all that super range of colors. It's just how finely can you slice and dice your red, blue, gray and put them together as independent combinations. For example, if I only can have you know, four levels of red, four levels of green, four levels of blue, then I get four times four times four, that's 64 colors. That's my 64 color resolution. But clearly if I can have more resolution in color for each one of those, I can create more number of combinations and that gives me more unique colors in my display. Yeah, any questions? How do you know you're taking 16 bits or 8 bits? Good question. So when you take a picture with the camera, you have to go to the camera settings and set that before you take the image. For most microscopy softwares, um, it's often you either get an interface with your microscopy software that tells you what the bit depth is and gives you an option to downsample it. Uh, in some cases, it's built in, but even if it's built in, make sure you know what it is. So it depends on the specific software, but usually if you just Google, how do I find the bit depth of this camera, you should get an answer for it. That, that's what I always do when in doubt Google. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I know that like, for example, my camera or like most of the cameras, uh, their sensor, they like, it's not like one pixel can pick up red, blue, or green. It's more like there are four pixels. Yep, there's yep. one picking up red, one picking up yeah. green, and one picking up blue. But I feel like in my cross to be... We're going to... There, uh, we're going to come to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> do you want to go ahead or do you want to wait for the next yeah. section? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Any other questions, folks? I'm going to hop on then to uh, a small topic. Again, I think this is kind of like the last theory-ish thing before we actually code. Uh, compression, data storage, and file types. So when you save an image file, you usually have two things that you're saving. One is, of course, the actual pixel values and their positions. The second is called the metadata. That is the data about the data. So that describes you know, for like I mentioned, what is the pixel to micron conversion scale of your detector? For example, my hardware configuration on my scope is set up such that with my particular 20X objective and my particular camera model set with the connections that they have given a certain distance, it produces 0.65 microns per pixel on my detector. Now, if I change the distance by putting a tube lens inside, that's going to change because if I move my detector, you know, it's going to be bigger and I'm going to get crappier resolution. If I move my camera closer, I might get something better. So that's something decided by your hardware configuration. And you should know that to measure physical distances on your image. If you want to measure the actual size of a cell in microns, you can only measure it in pixels on your image. And then you need that scale to convert. The second thing is dimensions and bit depth is the third, which we just talked about. And uh, pixel size usually 
it's built in, it's what you buy. Objective properties, there are many microscope softwares that, you know, build it in. Like, which objective did you take this image on? Those get auto-attached to it. And all of these metadata sometimes get put together in this format called OME tip, which is a very nice new format that's kind of up and coming that folks are developing to capture all the metadata along with an image. So if you can save your files as OME tips, that's usually like a nice option because your metadata is standardized and it's easy when you want to publish and share these images. What's an example of an objective object property? Uh, NA, for example. Did I take it on a 20x.3 NA or 0.8 NA? And these are also things that you build into your microscope control software. So it's usually just auto-filled. You don't have to do anything for it. And uh, Fiji, for example, has plugins that are able to read OME TIFF. So you'll be able to get your microscope properties out of it. Scikit image, I don't think has a plugin to read that. I'm not sure. So compression. Compression basically means you kind of reduce your data somewhere to save space, right? Like I said, you create like hundreds of gigabytes of numbers. Uh, you might want to reduce that, sure. But there are a few things that you just need to be aware of before you do that. Firstly, whenever you do analysis, you want to be aware of, you know, what your limitations are, right? Like what is your least count in resolution? or how much intensity can you measure? How much size can you measure? That comes from your raw data. It's usually best. So try to always work on your raw data. Also don't just work on the raw data, like store it somewhere, create a copy and work on the copy. Because your raw data is like a treasure. Treat it like a treasure that's gonna go away if you so much as blow on it. And when you publish, you do wanna sometimes put your raw data on a repository somewhere. It is huge. You need a lot of service space. Agreed, sure, but it's it's your gold standard. And uh, typically, you know, these raw data it depends on the microscope that you're collecting it on. You can get many different formats. You can also save it as TIFF files. And TIFF files you can create like uncompressed versions, which if you want to export as images, I would generally uh, suggest this. And also please don't delete your raw data until and unless your manuscript is actually published, like a reviewer or anybody can ask you for this at any point of time and try to hang on to your raw data. You know, like it, it really matters. The second thing you can do, if you just wanna like, you know, package your images, share it with somebody, you don't care so much about uh, the accuracy at that point, you can do lossless compression, which uh, it compresses it in such a way that you can always reconstruct the original data from whatever compressed thing you have. The algorithm works in that way. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, you won't get too much of a reduction in file size. You know, you won't go from 5 GB to like 10 MB. You'll go from maybe 5 GB to 2 GB, uh, which is significant. But if that's not what you're looking for, too bad. PNGs and TIFF files and BMPs are all lossless compressions, meaning you can reconstruct the data. Um, it's good for, you know, when you're making an image for a figure or something, use your lossless compression. That's a good option. And yeah, it can be quite practical. The third thing is lossy compression. Some compression algorithms throw away data. It's kind of like downsampling your bits once you've thrown that data away, you can never get it back. What is gone is gone forever. JPEGs are a big culprit because they are so popular. We all want to save our images as JPEGs and never, ever, ever, ever make the mistake of analyzing a JPEG image. Your values are just simply not accurate. Like you're, you're not doing good science if you analyze JPEGs. So be super careful about that. It's great if you want to put it on, you know, your lab website or something. It's cute. It will really reduce from 5 GB to 10 MB. Never analyze it. That's the one thing I'd really like you guys to take away from today. Please don't analyze files that have been compressed with loss. It's, it's, it's just not real anymore. 
Is it Jif or Gif? I say Jif. <laughs> Um, yeah, the last thing I wanted to mention, sometimes when you take confocal stacks or tiled images of pathology sections and stuff like that, you'll come across something called image pyramid, which is a very fancy way of saying that you have this full resolution image, but if you want to really zoom out and look at it, you don't need all that detail. It can't even display all that detail properly. So what it does, it basically subsamples and stores a smaller version. Subsamples and stores an even smaller version. So it shows a stack of images, each one that's slightly smaller and blurrier than the other. So the top image is what it'll show you when you're like, you know, looking at the whole thing. And as you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, it'll start going down this stack. And it saves all these different versions of the same image because it doesn't want to keep doing this subsampling calculation while you're zooming in and out in real time. So it's basically giving you some amount of speed in working with the interface. The trade-off is that you just need a little more space to store this image. So that's all image pyramid means. It's nothing special. If you come across it, like, you know, don't get intimidated. Just go to your maximum zoom version if you're analyzing anything in your raw data. Um, the last concept, yeah, did you have a question, anybody? Okay, the last concept I wanted to make sure I told you guys was how much space do you need to save your images? I come up against this all the time, right? Like when I set up my microscopy experiments, it's usually 7 p.m., I'm desperate to go home and I find that the hard disk is full. Um, so how much space do I really need to free up in order to do that particular experiment? And clearly, the bit depth gives me the number of bits I need to store one pixel in one image. The dimensions of my image are going to give me the number of pixels, say, you know, 3K by 4K, 8-bit, so I can multiply. If you have different color channels or fluorescence channels, treat each of them as an independent image and just multiply by that number. And if you are taking a video, those also just increase your number of images. So just multiply the whole thing and that gives you the total number of bits that you need to store your image. After that, it's a question of converting from bits to you know, bytes and gigabytes or whatnot. Remember that the conversion factor is 1024, not 1000, and that makes a little bit of a difference. So now you know how to calculate your image size. If I tell you that I have a two-bit image, which is 10 pixels by 10 pixels, then that is 100 pixels into two bits, that's 200 bits. And if I have 10 such images, then that is 2000 bits or just under two kilobytes. That's what I need to store my image. Yeah, so calculate the size. And whenever you've actually collected an image file, just look at the size and the properties of your image and do a small calculation to make sure it makes sense. Like don't make assumptions about the image. That's a very quick way to figure out if something is fishy or you've stored the right thing. Oh, a frame is just a snapshot that you take, like oh, for example, in video data. Yeah, 10 frames is just 10 snapshots. Okay. The last concept before we jump into our notebook is called lookup tables. Uh, how do you display your image? So far in all the sketches, I just showed you black and white that you just say, oh, this is gray and that is white and whatnot. You don't have to do that. You can just assign colors to it. It's just the same as assigning colors to your heat map or whatever. An image is essentially a heat map. There's like a whole lot of different color maps that you can use. What people recommend sometimes for quantitative data is this thing on the top called perceptually uniform sequential color maps. What it means is that if I go 10 steps in color, I am actually going 10 steps in my data. So the difference between two data points, my human mind perceives that in proportion to the actual difference. 
There is, if you look at, you know, other things like this, and they go from here to here, the difference that your mind perceives in the color need not be the same from here to here versus here to here. Okay, so to facilitate a human being looking at your data, you typically use perceptually uniform color maps. And people have done like all sorts of, you know, psychology models of like how we perceive color and blah, blah, and come up with these things. Um, something you can also do is use sometimes qualitative color maps. Like for example, if you want to label every cell in an image a different color, you don't want neighboring cells to have similar colors, right? You want them to be pretty different. So you use qualitative color maps. And there's a huge list online. You can find it and use something that makes your image look really funky. We're going to play with a whole bunch of these soon. Any questions so far? Cool. Uh, let's switch to our notebook, if you guys are ready, and go through some of these concepts. Like I told you, in this workshop, we're only going to be playing with data that's built in to um, Scikit-Image. But in case you ever want to import an image from your computer to load on this, I've just given you the syntax there as a comment so you can use that. And again, as a reminder for executing every cell, you just click this play button and you should get that green check mark and move on, okay? So the first thing is that mitosis image that I showed you guys where you talked about whether you can analyze it by hand or not. We're going to download that. And here I put in a command to pull out what is the metadata associated with this image. And you can see there's like a whole bunch of things, right? For example, there is this thing called max, which is the maximum pixel value in that image. There is mean, which is its average pixel value, and minimum. Then there's n bytes, which is the number of bytes used to store that image. So it's like the size and the memory. There's number of dimensions. It's a 2D image, but it could also be 3D, for example, if you have like a stack of images or something. And uh, what else? You have the shape, which is number of pixels per size, and yeah, a whole lot of things, essentially. So you can look at these properties and you can also just look at the numbers in the image. So if you see, these are all actually integers. Whereas the previous image that I showed you was all decimals, right? Yeah. So that shows you that images can have actually different ranges. So sometimes 8-bit images are stored as integers from 0 to 255. But you can also convert all images to a scale of 0 to 1, where you just you know divide by 255, everything goes from 0 to 1. And sometimes that is really important for processing your images. And those are called converting the images to float. OK? So here, I'm just going to like display the image with a color bar. So this is a perception uniform color bar. Uh, it's a color map called, it's, it's just a default color map called Viridis. And you can see that, you know, all these bright spots are highlighted in colors that represent higher values. Why is it like some brighter than others? Um, the yes. It could be, I think it's the density of the chromatin. Yes, I don't. I think look at the paper from which this image was taken. It's actually pretty well known. It's it's a cell paper from twenty sixteen where they were looking at some rates of, but it's it's usually like the chromatin density that's same as intensity. Possibly, yeah, and I I do think I've seen papers where people actually try to map out uh, density within the nucleus to the processes that are actually going on there. So that's actually a really good point. Yep. 
Great. So this is just the default color map, right? I put in another example here where you can display exactly the same thing, but in black and white. So note that the image has always been black and white, okay? Because black and white is just a sequence of numbers. There's, there's nothing to it. It's like a unidimensional color representation. But I can display it with this black and white color bar, or I can display it with this fancy, fancy color bar here. It's still the same image. It's the same values. Nothing has changed except what colors you map it to. So none of the data is different between these two images. So the point here that I was trying to make is the two images can look totally different, but have the same exact quantitative data between them. Yep. How do you know that figure is eight by eight? Is that um, oh, I just randomly put this size of eight by eight. I don't know what the dimension is. It's it's yeah, it's just like how much display size it gives on this. Okay. It's just from experience messing with this notebook, I thought it looked good. Okay, cool. But you can put whatever you want in it. It's it, it's just what Python is using to display on screen. A quick question, yeah. Harry. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a silly question actually. So what that silly. 250 mm -hmm. on the you know these numbers on the number scale uh, oh, define right. like 250 pixels or how do we say that right it's actually the intensity value okay okay intensity so like you know what you map the number of photons to correct oh okay yeah makes sense so 250 that's why it's a brighter so it will come up there 250 exactly yep. yeah and this is an 8-bit image so it's mm -hmm. going from 0 to 255 and that's mm -hmm. why all the black is like around zero pixels and the pure right. black is around 255 as the right. pixel intensity value. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. correct. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. So in the next box, I want to highlight something interesting. So far, we just said that you can use different color maps to display the image, right? Which means one of the things that I can do here, I just randomly, arbitrarily said that black is zero and white is 255. There is nothing stopping me from saying black is 255 and white is zero. So I can flip the color map. That does nothing again to my pixel values. The pixel values stay exactly the same. So here I've used a color map called gray. If I use something called gray underscore R, it just flips the color map and it leaves the pixel values exactly as it is. But there is another operation that I can do from the util module of scikit image, which is called invert, inverting an image. So when I invert an image, this is what I do. It's zero to 255. So I subtract all the pixel values from 255 and get you know the other part of it or if it's zero to one i subtract all of them from one that subtracted from max image is called the inverted image and when you invert you're actually changing the pixel values so let's execute this code box you're gonna see that on the left all we did was we said white is zero, black is 255, and we kept the original values. But here, we're using the same, white is zero, black is 255, but we've actually inverted the image and changed all the pixel values. And what we've done here in the last one on the right is that we've used the inverted pixel values and again flipped the color bar to say black is zero and white is 255. So the point of doing this was to say that one thing is just changing the color that you assign to each pixel value. But when you invert, you're actually changing pixel values. So even though these two images look identical, they are not the same. They have totally different, you know, reversed pixel values. And that's why don't get fooled by just what you see. Go in and actually check what the pixel values are. So my 
So it's a track from max, yeah. pixel value max. Yes, not max, max of the range. So if it's an 8-bit image, it's going to subtract from 255. Regardless of whether your max in the image is just 30 or 50. Max of the range. Max of the range, yes. The bit range. The bit range. If your image is a float from 0 to 1, it's going to subtract from 1. It doesn't matter what the max brightness of the image is. It's always going to subtract from max of the range. So if they have an invert. Yep. Exactly. This is Change, exactly it. Changing the pixel value. Yes, it changes the pixel value. Uh, invert is kind of a nice one because you can always change it back. But something that I always do in a lot of softwares is I never work on the original image. I make a copy of the image and I work on it. And then if I mess something up, I always have the original to go back to. So you can always use it. It's fine. Just be aware that the pixel values have changed and be intentional about it. Like if you wanted the pixel values to change, uh, because sometimes in a pipeline, it's difficult to detect dark spots, but you can detect bright spots. So in that case, you do want to invert your image. In that case, it's okay. As long as you're doing all other conditions. Yeah, yeah. you do it uniformly and you keep a copy of the originals. It's perfectly good. What would be an example of why you would invert it versus uh, changing the color scale? Good question. Uh, so changing the color scale, it's like on a whim, right? And that's actually your next box where you apply like all sorts of color scales to the same image. But when you invert it, it's like basically the example I gave right now. There are some filters, for example, which can pull out bright spots very well, but they can't pull out dark spots. Whereas like if quantity. you... Sorry? Quantity. Quantitate something, exactly, or to segment something, to identify those things. Yep. So in those cases, it's very convenient if you just flip and invert your image, and then you can pull out those bright spots. Say you have an algorithm that, for example, one way of thresholding is to just pull out minima. For that, if you want to pull out your bright objects as minima, you need to flip them and make them dark objects, and then you can run your algorithms. So it depends on your pipeline. Yeah, so let's see. The next two boxes are basically for you guys. I'm going to give you like five minutes to just execute these two boxes. And it's just having a bit of fun with different kinds of colors. I showed you all those different types of color bars. There's a perceptually uniform, sequential, diverging, when you have, you know, say two different extremes and you really want to highlight it. Diverging color maps you use a lot in genomics data, right? Because you want to see whether there's a fold change increase or a fold change decrease. So it's like going in two different directions and you want to highlight that difference. So sometimes in images, if you want to highlight a difference or a contrast between extremes, you use diverging color maps. Cyclic color maps, are actually cute because they start and end at the same color. So if you're doing, for example, something that changes with time and goes back like a cell cycle kind of images or a set of images, you can start with uh, HSV, which starts with red and then end back with red and go through the whole rainbow in between. It's cute. And then uh, qualitative ones, which, uh, like I said, it builds neighboring values in very different colors so that you can really distinguish between, okay, this is cell one in red, cell two in yellow, and cell three in, um, I don't know, purple or whatever. So you're not going to confuse objects. And I put one more called uh, NatPy Spectral, where it usually makes your background black. So it's one of my favorite for microscopy images. And I'll just let you guys fill it in and try it out. It's called Hippie Spectral? Yep. It's like a rainbow, but starting at black and ending at gray, which makes it kind of cute and convenient for a lot of things where you want black backgrounds.
I ran that cell. Um, mm -hmm. Harry, I'm just getting uh, the first two images and the next four, um, I'm just getting the empty boxes there. Uh, um, am I doing something wrong? It's, yeah, I see. Okay. Uh, sorry, let me go up here. Right. So you did? Yeah, that's because I have put in the code for the first two. And then for the next, in the Coda version, this is where you start writing your own code. So I'm going to demo the Coda version a bit here. It says okay. hash your code here. So that's an indicator where you look at the example above and then say you copy this and then you put your piece of code here and you want the seismic scale, right? So you change that to seismic and then you should get the third box. So thanks for bringing that up, but this is a good example of, you know, how you use the coder version that you can use the examples that I've provided and just change the parameters to try out different options. Did that work? Yes, that worked. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for bringing these up. I feel like sometimes I maybe forget to say a couple of subtle things. So I'm glad you guys are actually bringing it up. You bet. How's it going for everyone in class? Did you all get up to this point? I'll give you guys like a few more minutes. So it's good. Take your time, take your time. There's no rush. Sure. We're going to take a break in two minutes. That works. So I'm just going to quickly move through uh, the next cell before giving you guys a break. The next cell is just a contour map of the image, which is basically just taking lines of equal intensity and drawing those lines. Okay, so it's just a simple function called contour, which is built into the plotting software. And here you can basically like isolate uh, images of, you know, where the intensity is a certain range. You know what a contour plot is? It's like the stuff that you get on maps that show the same height, it's the same thing. So let's take a five minute break and reconvene at 11.20. I just on the contour map, I noticed like you've got the two different colors. So are those like thresholds that you can set? Like this is just this? Like there's the purple and there's the green. So I know yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can actually set thresholds. So if you if you Google for Matplotlib contour, it gives you the documentation for how to set the different threshold values. And you can essentially chop it very mm -hmm. So this is just the default that's in the This is just the default, yeah. I didn't want to complicate it. Mm -hmm. Yep. That doesn't look so much difference between the two sides. Yeah, it doesn't right now because I guess we're just plotting um, intensity. That's the thing. Um, there is one day three. We're actually going to be plotting with each cell number and so it will be better. So at that time, I just use the validated lines. It looks so much better than the other So I guess I'm going to go at this point. Maybe I can address it in the future. But here we're just looking for the intensity values. Also, like. Um, if you actually in some interfaces, if you click on that, um, so you need to see the value of specs, yeah. Oh, it's on the right. So 12 megapixels is nothing but instead if you actually go in and pick up the camera spec, it should tell you the bit depth. Oh. And you have to like really look for the thing. The consequence is not what I guess. 
is a green. Is it coming? Yeah. Too slow, too fast? It's currently here. Yeah. I'm used to this in my lab. Uh -huh. So I don't use Python. Oh, no, no, no. This is good. Great. So just recently, I had a crisis when I realized the reason mm -hmm. if I'm out of date sufficient. Uh, as a postdoc, yes, I don't want to be paying, yes, uh, mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah. I had that process of when I graduated, and actually, like, when my paper came out, and we built this software that we said, Oh, any collaborator across the world can use it, and people were like, Oh, we don't have that, we use a thousand years, and we don't have to write this stuff. So, I decided to switch. I guess one of the examples are. Logical, but I hope you can translate it to yeah, because yeah. it's been a long time since I worked with your MD system. Like, I'm not quite clear what examples I can think of. You think of anything, let me know. Okay, um, let's. Start back. I guess there's like a couple of people who will trickle in, but we'll let them trickle in. Um, I wanted to continue on the notebook a little bit. I showed you in this box up here that there are a lot of different attributes of the image that you can pull out, like the shape, for example. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of specific ones. If you want to get the properties of the image, D type gives you the data type. That is, is it an 8 bit image? Is it a float, integer, unsigned integer, and whatnot? So, for integer, I want to point out that um, there's actually two types signed and unsigned. So, unsigned is just going from, say, 0 to 255, whereas signed goes from minus 127 to minus 128 to 127. It's it's just a way of representing the data. It doesn't mean anything very deep, but just keep in mind that depending upon signed or unsigned, your actual pixel value range will change. So it depends on whether you move zero to the bottom of the range or whether you have zero in the middle of the range. That's all it is. The other thing I told you you can do is pull out the minimum pixel value and the maximum pixel value. So you can see that your dimmest pixel has an intensity of seven and the brightest pixel is at 255. The other, the next thing, we talked about the scale of zero to 255 and I can, uh, I told you you can convert images to float, which is on the scale of zero to one. And this is important because tomorrow when we work with histograms and filters, a lot of the processes work on images that are scaled from zero to one. So it's not doing anything great. If it's zero to 255, it's just dividing all the pixels by 255 and normalizing it from zero to one, okay? You have a built-in routine called image as float, which does that conversion automatically for you. And then you can look at its data type. It's like float 64. And you can see the minimum value and the maximum value. Seven got converted to whatever seven by 255 is and 255 got converted to one. The next box is just another illustration of converting to a different data type. And this is to 16 bit signed integer. And you know, this just flips the range once again. It's, it's all the same, it's just numbers. But here, another thing I wanted to highlight is that your pixel values are changing. Of course they are changing. But since you're doing a uniform operation on all the pixels, you're keeping the same ratio of pixel values throughout your image. So you can still go ahead and process it quantitatively and it'll all be fine. You know, like it'll, it'll make sense as long as you do the same conversion on all pixels of the image uniformly. Oh, 32 and 32, we have to put the code. Uh, where, sorry? Should we make the code here? Oh, right. Um, it's just these codes, getting the, yeah, data type, and the minimum and maximum, so we just do those two. 
this Let me do a demo here. So, right, so I'm going to do another quick demo of what you do with the coding notebook. So over here, we're going to work with this mitosis float and find the new range and minimum and maximum values. So all you have to do is use this model that you have here that I've already given you and paste it here in place of your code. And the new image you're working with is image mitosis float. So change it to that image mitosis float everywhere. And then you can execute your code. This is basically what you need. So essentially throughout this notebook, this is more or less the level of coding or Python expertise that I kind of expect. And the reason again is to just make it user-friendly for everybody, whether or not you know Python and it's, Totally up to you, but don't get frustrated with me being like, oh, this was like the stupidest Python ever. Like it was meant to be. Right. So the last thing I wanted you guys to do was to take these three images, the original image, which is 8-bit, the second, the float image, which is from 0 to 1, and then the 16-bit signed integer image which are on three different ranges and just plot them using the same color bar. And what you'll see again is that they look absolutely identical, except the range on the color bar is different. So that's what I meant when I said, you've changed the pixel values, but you've done it uniformly throughout the image and you preserve the relationship of the pixel values to each other. So this is a completely valid operation that you can do on your images. And the bottom line is that images can look different and be identical, or they can look identical and be totally different. What is right and what is wrong is very specific to your situation. So check your data type to see whether you're making the right comparisons before going ahead. Like just use your logic and be aware of what you're doing. And if you're done with that, I'll give you like two minutes to finish up this section. And then we'll quickly go into doing RGB images and image sequences. Um, are you Priya? Are you there? I'm going to be there in a minute. Just give me a moment. Okay. So if you change all of these to, for example, this thing, it will just change the color scheme. Yeah, you had a question online, uh, Sapa. Yeah. Um... Hi there again. So a quick question, maybe a silly one for you. Uh, so when you said um, these images look identical, uh, mm -hmm. but they're not uh, absolutely the same. I'm just reading the title here. And so uh, let's say I compare the first and the third image. So whatever uh, operations or, uh, you know, uh, whatever 
uh, research uh, uh -huh. interpretations we have on first image uh -huh. that can be applied to the third image as well uh, yeah. and then that that would still be valid yes okay absolutely okay because okay. you've essentially preserved the ratio right like if this pixel is seven and this is right. 255 you preserve that ratio in the se second or the third image even though mm -hmm. the actual numbers are different so as long gotcha. as you preserve the ratio you're good okay that makes sense thank you because everything is relative you're never counting the absolute number of photons anyway correct so whatever you do on the relative scale is fine it's fine. Okay. The only Thank thing you. you can't do mm -hmm. is like, say, for example, you've inverted it or right, right. you square every pixel. Then right. No, that's not. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually changing the pixel itself. I mean, the number, you know, so we can't rely on that. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Like you're changing okay. the relationships between different pixels. Different values. pixels. Yep. That's okay. not okay. okay. But if you do it uniformly, that's okay. You mean, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for making that point clearer. Okay, folks, so we're going to power through the last 30 minutes, which is going to be a few, it's going to be slightly fragmented and we're going to like, um, I think I'll probably just hop through all the theory because it's fairly short and then we'll walk through the next three sections of the notebooks. I just wanted to make a quick mention, come back to RGB images. Oops. Uh, Helen mentioned earlier, right, that you have the uh, different channels. So there are some cameras that are actually RGB cameras, and they work in a few different ways. Like your camera cannot collect RGB unless it is physically configured to collect RGB. That is, there has to be something built into your camera that distinguishes red light from blue light from green light. So in most cameras, what they do, they actually put a little filter over every pixel. So every pixel is actually a cluster of four pixels. And over two of them on the diagonals, they put a red filter and a blue filter, like you see right here, the, red, the blue filter and the red filter. And the other two along the diagonal are green filters. And the reason they do this, this blue to green to red is one to two to one, is because our eyes are twice as sensitive in green than in blue or red. So by collecting green in two pixels and collecting blue and red in only one pixel and adding that, you're kind of mimicking what the eye sees because the eye is not, the human eye is not equally sensitive in all these wavelengths. So this is the most common type of camera that you'll find. This is what your phone camera has to detect color, for instance. There are some others that basically do it by, you know, layering different semiconductor materials that are sensitive at different wavelengths and whatnot. There's a lot, of, and, and some things do, you know, using lenses or prisms to split wavelengths. There are a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, doesn't matter what it is, but you need the hardware to detect RGB. Just a uh, question. Mm -hmm. um, this is about capturing. This is also for display as well, or display is completely different. You know, TVs and all that, you mm -hmm. know, nanopixel, micropixel, mm -hmm. greens. Yeah. So TVs are actually very similar. So, okay. It's a good point that you brought up because uh, if you if you have like an LED display, you would have the same thing. You'd have a blue LED, a red LED, and two green LEDs for one pixel, right. and you just you know light them up with the correct intensity at each. So it's exactly the same principle. Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, the simple thing that you guys need to remember is just that you measure an intensity in each of these three colors, red, green, and blue. And if you put those three values together, say 0.7 in R, 0.5 in green, and 0.8 in blue, that gives you a unique color. That's all it is. Color is just three different intensities of red, green, and blue mixed together. And it's called a color triplet. So you can actually like play with this online in some color wheels, you know, you can put different values or even in uh, paint, for example, you can put three different values for red, blue, and green between zero to 255 and see what unique color you make out of it. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, 
but basically what it means is that the camera is actually taking not one picture but three pictures because it's taking a picture in red it's taking a picture in green and it's taking a picture in blue and it's mushing these three pictures together to give you your color image so essentially your rgb color image is just three ordinary black and white images stitched together okay um if you take a black and white uh, sorry, if you take a black and white image, you can convert color to RGB by essentially getting just the total intensity, right? Instead of splitting it up as red, blue, and green, you just add up all those intensities that gives you a total number of photons, and that's just grayscale, like a single color dimension. So you don't do a simple addition. Instead, you do this vector addition that gives you the grayscale value. And if you want to represent a grayscale, and in RGB triplet format, it's just equal values. I don't know, again, if you've ever gone and played with this, but, you know, in color triplets, 000 is black, 111 is white, and say 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is gray, and 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 is like dark gray, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 is light gray, and so on. So if you have the three values equal, that's your white to black gray scale color value. I would encourage you to actually just go to Microsoft Paint or something and just play with it. Put in those numbers, see what the triplets look like, and get a feel for the color. So you can convert grayscale to RGB? You can convert grayscale to RGB, but it's going to look grayscale. You can't make the grayscale look red or blue. So even if you convert to RGB, you're only going to convert it to this triplet representation where it looks exactly the same. Nothing is going to be different. If you did split the wavelengths when you collected the image, you cannot split the colors afterwards. The second way you can increase dimensions is videos. And I'm going to add one more aspect to this. You can also do confocal stacks where a confocal stack is essentially you take a bunch of images that go from the bottom of a thick section all the way up to the top. So you take multiple images that slice through your sample. And this is also basically exactly the same as you treat confocal stacks exactly the same as videos. You're essentially adding one dimension extra and slicing it and taking a lot of images. For videos, that dimension is time. For confocal stacks, that dimension is thickness, okay? In this course, I'm not so sure we'll actually get the time to go into videos that much. So I've given you some material to look at, but we'll come back to it on day three if we have time for it. For now, all I want you to take away is that videos and confocal stacks are four-dimensional data sets. That is, you have the X and Y 2D of each image, you have the pixel intensities, which is the third dimension. You can think of it like a height. And then you have multiple of these along time or thickness, which is your fourth dimension. So simple things that you can do with video data or with confocal stacks. Um, ah, this is not playing, oh no. Well, if it plays, I'll figure it out for you on day three. But this is a really important one. You can take all of the images and just add them together or you can take the average of them or you can multiply all of them together that's perfectly valid and in our notebook we'll see a couple of examples how that can be a super useful technique to do a few interesting things the other thing i wanted to point out you've been seeing that images are basically just numbers tied to spatial locations and that is just the mathematical representation of a matrix. So anything you can do with a matrix, you can do on an image. And that allows us to manipulate the shape of an image. For example, if you take a matrix, you can rotate it, right? And every rotation operation that you can do is essentially like possible. That's exactly how you rotate an image. So we're going to look at a couple of transformations. One is scaling which is making the image bigger or smaller. The second is translation, which is shifting the image or a piece of the image from one place to another place. The third is rotation, which is you just take the image and turn it by an angle. 
And the fourth is called skew. So I'm going to draw skew for you here. If this is the image, and then I do this. I push it along one direction like this. This is called skewing the image, that you go from a rectangle to a parallelogram like this. You get rid of the right angles, essentially. These four transformations, scaling, translation, rotation, and skew, are very, very special because they all share a very specific property. For example, if I have a point here and a point here in my original image, or even, you know, uh, yeah, let's take a point. Here. Yeah, let's take a point here. I can draw a line between these two points, right? Now, if I've skewed this, this point is going to go maybe here, and this point will go maybe here. But I can still draw a line between these two points. So if two points happen to be on a straight line, in all of these transformations, they will continue to be on a straight line. I'll give you another example with rotation. So say I have a very rectangular image like this, and I have these two points that are on a line, and then I rotated that rectangle. The two points are on the same line, right? So I've not done anything to make them not be on the same line. It seems like a really trivial, stupid property because this is obvious. How can they not be on the same line, right? But there are some transformations like warping which spoil that property. And we're going to jump into our notebook in a moment and look at some examples so that you, you do it and you build the intuition for it. The last thing that I just want to mention, we're not going to actually do this it's called image registration. And the concept is very simple. Say I took one picture like this, which has, you know, some objects here. And then I took another image, which accidentally I took it kind of like this. Okay, so. This is what I get in the second image. I cut out this bit a little, I have this, and then this comes further in. Now I want to take this image and match it to this somehow, okay? So what do I have to do? First, I have to rotate it back a bit, and then I have to translate it and make it stitch, right? So I'm essentially doing a sequence of these affine transformations to match this image position to this image. And this aspect of matching by doing affine transformations is called image registration. I, we won't go into it in detail, but there are functions that exist for it in the toolbox or in any image processing toolbox. So as long as you're aware that this exists, you can go ahead and use those functions. So- yeah, Image registration of the rotate it's a combination of any of these operations. And that's the challenge with registration, to find what is the sequence of operations and by how much do you do each of these operations to get image one from image two. Second question is uh, mm -hmm. about um, encryption. Is encryption, because all these are matrix transformations, or uh -huh. just multiplying by matrix by another uh -huh. matrix? Is that, is that like, and when you think about encrypted images, is that what we're thinking about? Huh. Can I, things like that? I don't know how to answer that question because I don't have a clue about how images are encrypted, but I can look into this. This is interesting, and I will get back to you tomorrow with an answer on this. In theory, what you're saying is absolutely plausible because everything is just matrix operations. Yeah, you can do that. And in theory, yes, as long as you can, you have the key, you can decrypt an image. Um, it makes total sense to me. I will just go and verify whether yeah, that's yeah. actually how it works. Great. So we're going to work through sections two, three, and four. It's going to be uh pretty clear 
So for section two, I'm going to use um, some histology data here, which I've pulled up. And you can see that it is an RGB image. The next thing I'm going to do is actually just split them up. So here I've split it up into red, green, and blue. What you'll immediately notice is that it, it looks a little ugly, right? Like, look at this. This looks so clean. It didn't exactly split it the way you would expect, did it? Like, is this what you expected? How many of you expected this? I guess no one. So actually, it kind of makes sense because if you look at this region, it's very red, very green, and very blue. And if you add the three together, you get something that is very white. But essentially, the takeaway is that, you know, sometimes when you split the color, it's not so obvious what you're going to get in each channel. There is... So these are standard pathology images. And so there's actually a built-in function in scikit image. If you want to separate this very nice, you know, brown staining here from these blue nuclei and stuff, I'm not going to get into the details of this. I've essentially given you the code for it. But there is this thing. Uh, HED is hematoxylin, uh, eosin, and DAB staining for pathology. And you can split it. If you display it in RGB, it still doesn't make sense. So you're supposed to do one more step, which you can look at later. All of this is built in, but the bottom line is that you can split these two channels. There are built in functions in all image processing softwares if you're interested in pathology images to actually split your stains in different channels. So for very standard staining techniques, you can convert from RGB to that staining color space and you know switch your images around. Are these messing around with the uh, bit, um, bit rate, like the version we were talking about, or are these uh, uh, gradients changes? So it's actually taking very specific combinations of RGB. So it essentially knows that if you do hematoxylin staining, it's a certain proportion of blue plus a certain fraction of red. So it does those kinds of transformations and converts from just your RGB axis to something slightly different, but it's a linear transformation. So again, a couple of quick points that I mentioned. You can take this image and convert it to grayscale. It's a very simple function in the color module called RGB to gray that does this. And you took this color image put it through that and you get this grayscale image. And this makes perfect sense, right? Like this place is white. So you assume it has very high intensity everywhere. And yes, you did get something white in your grayscale. These things are pretty dark. So the dark regions, you do get pretty dark here. So that makes sense. This is just an intensity thing. And the next question we're going to ask is, can we convert the grayscale image back to color? There is a function called gray to RGB. I can apply it. And when I apply it, this is what I get. This is the original RGB image. This is taking my grayscale image and converting it into RGB. It did nothing to recover the original color. Because when I convert it to grayscale, I've added the red, blue, and green together. And I've forgotten what the original values were. I don't know how to divide them back again. And that's why all it does is just divides them equally. Because that's the simplest thing it can do. And I told you, if you divide something equally between red, blue, and green, all you get is shades of gray. So that's why. Did that make sense? Howdy. Yeah. Um, in the previous code cell block, 
if uh -huh. you remove the color map flag, you don't get a grayscale image. I'm curious uh, why. If you move the color map? If you remove the C map flag is gray and just oh, right. plot. If you do something like this, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, why? Yep. Good you question. Know. It's because of what we saw in the previous section that even though you can have certain pixel values, you can map them to different colors. Got it. So this one has just used the default Viridus color map, which goes from yellow to blue instead of black to white. And that's why for grayscale images, I usually try to make it a point to include C map as gray, because otherwise this is the default. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. But it's it has, again, nothing to do with the pixel values. It's just a display. But then the bottom line is that when you actually converted it to grayscale, you took those three channels, red, blue, and green, you added them together to get a single value. And that single value of intensity is what you're showing in this image. In the next code block, you took that single value of intensity and you're trying to convert it back into three values. But it forgot what was the original ratio of red to blue to green in each pixel. So it just divided those three values equally. It, it doesn't know the original. It's just like, oh, whatever. Like she got like 0.8 for this pixel. I have no idea how to divide it. I'm just going to say 0.8 red, 0.8 green, 0.8 blue. And if you do that, all you get is gray. So essentially, you can convert color to grayscale. But once you've done the conversion, you can never get the original colors back again. Any questions before we move on? Yeah? No worries. Oh, yeah. So if you go, there's a space for you to do this. You can just copy that. So you can try it. So you get that right in there because that's the default color map. And then if you say C map equal to gray, then you'll get the green color. So you do it, you get a color. Cool. We're going to mess around a little bit now with uh, an image stack, which is it's a confocal stack and download the data. And I've put in this little applet for you that allows you to actually run through the images of the stack. So this is just an image of you know uh, cells with nuclei. And you should get something that looks like this initially, which is totally dark because I'm starting at the bottom of my stack. And you can see there are 60 slices in the stack. And as I keep dragging my slider here, you should start seeing stuff come up. So this is somewhere around 20. Oh, come on. All these frames? Yep. So you're essentially going through all the frames. I'm just going to reload this and do it well. OK, so I can go somewhere here. And I'm going to see like actual nuclei and cell membranes. If I go even further, we're actually going over the top of the nuclei. So you're skimming the surface of that tissue and you go all the way to the top, you have pretty much you know, gone through the entire section of cells. So you start here, there is nothing. 
Here you kind of sort of start seeing the cells. Here you're like really looking at them. This is the middle of the stack where you can see the nuclei and the cell membrane super clearly. And then you slowly start, you know, zooming out of the stack. Okay. So this photons are being captured on some of the frames and others not, and they're just trying to exactly. Uh, yep. So the technique works such that you illuminate not the entire sample. But you manipulate your light so that you're kind of like cutting through the sample and shining like almost a very thin torch through a very thin section of the sample. Like if this is the slide and your cells are sitting on it, normally when you illuminate, you shine the light, it shines through the whole thing. But in this technique, if you shine the light, you can shine it through a thin slice like this. And you take only that image. So you're not going to get anything from here or here. And likewise, you can do this. And if you cut that slice to go slowly all the way through, then you essentially get these stacked images. That's called what, what process? Confocal imaging. Okay, so I've given you some code to display, say, two different slices, one fourth of the way through. You can't really see the nuclei because they've barely begun to come into view. But then halfway through the stack, you're seeing the cytoplasm and the nuclei super, super, super clearly. What you're going to do in the next box is take something called a maximum intensity projection. That is, you're going to go through the entire stack See whatever is the maximum pixel value at that position and just pick that, you know, because if I have pixel values at this position here, 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 I'm going to decide that, okay, this is the brightest pixel and I'm going to put that value here for each pixel, okay? So it's like you're projecting the brightest and you should get something like this, which looks pretty nice for the nuclei because they're fairly self-contained, but a bit messy for the cytoplasm because that makes sense, right? The cytoplasm is all around. So you should get something that looks a bit messy. So it's uh, doing like a search for the maximum number mm -hmm. across all images and then- Yep. Yeah, in that position, yeah. in that position, yeah. And likewise, you can do a minimum intensity projection. And that you should obviously get something that looks pretty dark because, you know, the starting images looked pretty dark. The most interesting one, though, is the mean intensity projection, okay? And that averages the pixels across all the frames at every position. And this looks kind of stupid when I do it on this stack. It just gave me like the slightly dimmer image. But where I found it to be supremely useful is in videos. If you want to get your background of the video so that, you know, say you have a little grid like this and you have like, I don't know, maybe ants running around in this grid and the grid is like this arena of a particular shape and you want to subtract the grid and just get the positions of the ants. What you can do, the ants are all moving around. So if you have a video, you take the average of the video of all the frames and the ants are changing their position. So they're all going to get averaged and erased. But your grid or your arena is staying in exactly the same place. So if you take the average, you're going to get something that looks like this, just the arena. It's like your background image as though you had no ants or no cells or no moving objects. So when you do this for a video, it's a fantastic way of just getting your background. You subtract it from this image and then you just get the positions of the ants. So it's like a super smart trick that you can use. And this is called a mean intensity projection. And the last thing I told you, I think we're just gonna take five minutes more. Uh, We're just going to pull up the middle image. I told you, you can add all the images together when you're taking the average. 
So that's pretty simple. That's a matrix operation. And here I've just added together the nucleus and cytoplasm images. So they essentially just got superimposed on top of each other, right? It's a pretty simple operation that you just take the pixels, mush them on top, that's it. One of the important things that you need to do when you add is make sure that you're not going above your range. If you have 8-bit images from 0 to 255, if your maximum pixel values are 255 and 255, you add them both together, you're not going to get 510 because your range is just 0 to 255. You're going to get 255. So that's not real adding. In that case, what you want to do is half the first image, half the second image, and add them together. So then, you know, 255 by 2 plus 255 by 2 gives you 255. So when you add images, just be super careful about the range. Don't go over range, otherwise you'll just saturate out pixels. Same for RGB? Same for RGB, yeah. And the last thing I do want to touch today is something called profiling, which is a very simple thing to do. I've taken this image that we just made by adding, drawn a line across it, and just asked, what is the intensity of the pixels at each point of this line? And I get this plot here. So this is around 50. I have these super bright dividing nuclei. So it's like super high intensity. Then here around 150, I'm going through a nucleus. So that's pretty nice over here. The utility of profiling, why you should always do it, especially in fluorescence images, is because this is my signal over here and over here. And this is the background. I told you the background is never zero, even if it looks dark. So when you want to estimate what is your average background level and what is your average signal level, and make sure you're getting enough height of your signal above your background, profiling is the technique that you want to use. A lot of softwares have profiling built in where you can draw a line and check. Another thing it helps you do is check if the illumination across your field of view is even or not. Because if it's not, if you draw a line, then the background will go something like this. You know, it'll be high at one point and low at the other. And if that is the case, then you want to correct your images for that. You want to do a background correction. So profiling is a very important operation to make sure you have the background right. The others are like fairly simple. It's just like a bit of matrix multiplication. So I'll just let you guys do that on your own. It's not that important. And the last part is simply a demo. I don't think there's anything for you to do here. So I'm just going to illustrate the concepts. This is an example of translation. I'm going to take this red patch and I've moved it, you know, down here. So essentially I can translate a piece of the image from one area to another. I can rotate the image and it's just a simple, you know, rotate command. I've rotated it by some random angle. You can put whatever you like here. And then I told you there are some transformations that are non-affine, that don't preserve two points being along a line. Here is an example of that transformation. This whirlpool kind of thingy, if I have two points along a line, they're kind of going to get messed around and like spun around and whatever, right? Or if I take three points along a line, they're totally not going to be in a line anymore. So these are called non-affine transformations. As far as possible, when you're really manipulating images, try to avoid non-affine transformations because it's really hard to, you're manipulating spatial positions in a way that's not uniform across your image. So this is not okay. Whenever you do transformations to an image, when you do registration, always make sure to use affine transformations. So I think that's, the end of what we have for today. Um, do you guys have any questions so far? That's called mean projection. This is called mean intensity projection. Yes. That's right. Yeah. The quiz is going to be mailed out okay. around 12.30. And I'll just put it on the class mailing list so that all of you can review it. And we'll go over it at 9 o'clock tomorrow. It's probably going to take like 15 minutes and it's concepts that we've really hammered in class today just so you get the basics right 
tomorrow is going to be fairly heavy. We're going to do these topics. We're going to start actually with image filtering. Filtering is like one of the most fundamental things that you can do to images. It's like how you clean, how you denoise, how you, you know, uh, like blur things and smooth the image and whatnot. And then the second thing, the super cool, fun, interesting stuff is if I have this background and I want to isolate my nuclei, how do I pull out a picture of just the nuclei? And to do that, we have to understand the distribution of pixel intensities. So we're going to start with the distribution and what it looks like. Build some intuition on how do you cut the distribution to get, for example, only nuclei or only dividing nuclei. We're going to do a few manual examples to intuit the concept and then run into some algorithms that will automate segmentation of cells. And this is like the absolute core of any image analysis pipeline. That's going to be the bread and butter for tomorrow. So yeah, help yourself to some snacks if you would still like some. And thank you so much for coming today. Hi, I have one last question for you, sure. or maybe two. Um, I guess I was wondering on image J, uh -huh. uh, I've noticed that uh, for the projections, it also gives us a uh, I believe it's like standard distribution. Like if you want to get the standard distribution of the pixel intensity uh -huh. and also the the median, right? So I guess I'm I wanted to ask you, uh, like when would you use one over the other? So standard distribution versus the mean intensity, right? So the distribution gives you the total range. So it's kind of like, you know, you're getting from the brightest to the dimmest. So for example, if you want to see, you know, what is the range of noise that I'm getting on a particular image, you can go for the distribution. I That's going to work. There is, Got it. See, you know, okay, what is the average across the whole thing? One value, just one value that gives me the middle of that distribution. Is my image bright or is it dark? That's all I want to see. So in that mm -hmm. case, you can go in for just the mean value. And, you know, that would just give you that one answer. I don't gotcha. answered your question exactly right, because I don't recollect using those functions in Fiji, but I can go back and look at it and check for it and let you know again tomorrow. Okay, for sure. Awesome. But I'm sure most of the time with image processing, right, it's like trial and error, just seeing what cleans up the best, right? It is a certain extent of trial and error, you're right. But there's also a little bit of like method to the trial and error. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things we'll go into tomorrow. Like, when do you try what? Like there are some images right. better to apply certain filters and total rubbish to apply certain other filters. I see, I see. We're going to go through those kinds of cases tomorrow. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Looking yeah. forward to tomorrow. Yeah. Like, yeah, the logic behind which algorithms you apply. Got it. All right. Thank you. Looking forward to tomorrow. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for all your questions, everyone. I have a sure. Uh, there was a step where, where we went no from uh, an AP no to a flow, just that made it sound indeed. And so, is the order of operation matter like it has been afterwards or before I turn it into a flow? Because then, if, if, I guess if you if you build first, yeah. you're not going to get the same reaction. It's a gradient. Yeah. So the order totally matters. When you bounce over and you lose data, you can't get that data. So it doesn't matter. So the flow is like it's the super bit so you get like sufficient accuracy to actually store and the range is from zero to one, so you're not really doing anything much to it. But you try to give you unintentionally higher accuracy than you really do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I think that it's uh, 
session was firstly during thanksgiving week like i thought on the monday tuesday wednesday before thanksgiving and it was during the strike oh, wow. so oh, yeah. we had like four people and two of them wouldn't even sign the attendance sheet because they were technically on strike oh, wow. oh, wow. so it was kind of funky so this time was like a lot livelier but i guess yeah, this is like a nice class size. It's yeah. it's not too crowded. There's enough time for me to go over everyone. And something I'm noticing is that the pace of the class is actually slower this time because of a few asking questions. I totally thought I was going to finish this material by 11 o'clock and have you guys be bored and go home early. There you go over. There you go over. We're going to get all the like, uh... Uh, you know, I'm also like relatively new to this stuff. So, thanks for all your questions. You guys were a great class. Uh, yeah, there's like a bunch of meeting rooms just around the corner, and there's this nice room. I mean, yeah <laughs> 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 Slide on the double doors. 